Writing out a galvanic or voltaic cell can be kind of a big job. So there's a shorthand notation which is used, which I think is important to talk about. The um, copper 2 plus plus zinc going to zinc 2 plus plus copper in the shorthand notation can be written like this right here. And there's a reason why everything is written as it is. So first of all, in the shorthand notation, electrons are moving from left to right, from the oxidation to the reduction. Of course, that means the anode is on the left and the cathode is on the right. So the anode half cell would be zinc going to zinc 2 plus, and you can see it's a solid initially going to a zinc 2 plus solution, so water's the solvent. The cathode would be copper 2 plus, gaining two electrons going to copper metal. Um, and that's what the anode and cathode means. Now, the single lines and the double lines are important. The single lines are a phase boundary. So in the zinc to zinc 2 plus, you're going from a metal solid to a water-based solution. That's a boundary, a phase boundary. Same thing for copper 2 plus going to copper. The double line means the salt bridge. So the salt bridge connects the two and stuff like we talked about. So if you can use this shorthand notation, it does make your life a lot easier. Fat cat. I love cats, as you can tell. I really do. I'm using weird things from here. But anyway, fat cat means from anode to cathode. And that's another thing that you can throw in there. Electrons flow from the anode, from the site of oxidation to the cathode, to the site of reduction. Anyway, my cats are actually very large, large and I still love them. So, you know, no shaming and stuff like that. But maybe fat cat will help you understand redox. Then. Let's describe this shorthand galvanic cell using the notation shown. Okay, no problem. Electrons are flowing from the left to the right. That means the anode site of oxidation is the left. We would write copper going to copper 2 plus, and because we're hip chemists, we know it's a two electron process, all right? The 1.0 molar means the copper 2 plus concentration, 1.0 moles per liter. And we'll talk about how that can be important to us later on. Then there's the salt bridge, the double lines. The cathode would be chlorine gas going to chloride. And again, you can see that two negative ones on the chloride means that chlorine is gaining two electrons to become two chlorides. Um, the 1.0 atmosphere, that's the pressure of the gas. And the 1.0 molar for the chloride means, of course, it's one mole per liter in solution. This one also has a platinum at the end, all right? You need something to transfer the electrons to. And if copper doesn't do the job, and sometimes it doesn't, another really good metal is platinum. So this one has a platinum electrode. Platinum is relatively uh, invulnerable to a lot of chemical reactions. There are some things that will react it, absolutely. But platinum is a little better type of electrode to use in electrochemistry. It's able to do uh, more things without being degraded. And again, it's not totally invulnerable, but it's a better choice. And so in this case, that's what we're using. In a voltaic electrochemical cell, an oxidation occurs at an electrode called the anode. The electrons released at the anode travel through a wire to another electrode called the cathode, where the electrons are consumed in a reduction reaction. Anions are then shuttled through a salt bridge from the cathode compartment to the anode compartment. Otherwise, a net negative charge would build up in the cathode compartment. The negative charges move in a circuit through the cell. So this is another kind of galvanic or voltaic cell. It's a reaction that occurs when you put everything together. And like before, there's a site of oxidation, the anode. There's a site of reduction, the cathode. There's a salt bridge connecting them, stuff like that. But one of the things that's really interesting here, in the last example, zinc was going to zinc 2 plus, and zinc was giving up two electrons, and copper 2 plus was being turned into copper. In this reaction, Copper is being turned into copper 2 plus. So you can see up here the electrons are flowing this way, away from the copper. So copper here is turning into copper 2 plus, and the electrons, which go through the circuit and go down here, the electrons are going down to the silver side, and silver plus is becoming silver metal. And in the process, then, the anions that are excess on the silver side are going through the salt bridge over to the copper 2 plus side. So again, all 
the kind of things exhibit uh, from the last one are here, but notice that copper is reversed. Like copper was taking the electrons last time, making copper two plus into copper metal. In this reaction, the copper metal is turning into copper two plus. We're gonna see that a voltmeter can be really helpful to us in a little bit. We're not quite there yet, but that's gonna help us to see how the direction of these reactions will go. Here's a reaction, a shorthand notation, and I'd like you to tell me which species is being oxidized. Well, remember that in a shorthand notation, electrons always flow from left to right. So when something is being oxidized, it's creating the electrons. So this one is definitely going to be the zinc, the first thing listed. The silver plus is being reduced into, or thanks for playing, the gold plus on the right side is being reduced to gold metal, but it's the zinc is the source of electrons. Zinc is making zinc 2 plus. Electrons are flowing from the left to the right. Now the sign of the battery terminals in galvanic cells is important. The anode, which is the site of oxidation, that's where the electrons come from. And the electrons where they're coming from, that's the negative sign, all right? And I think about it like negative and negative repel. Electrons want to get away from the negative side. On the other hand, the cathode, which is the other side over here, the cathode is the site of the reduction, all right? That's the site that wants the electrons, so that's going to be positive. Electrons in a positive galvanic cell will go from the negative to the positive side, and that's uh, kind of cool. It can be reversed for other types of things, but that's something we won't talk about quite as much. Electrons are again flowing from the oxidation to the reduction, from the anode to the cathode, and this works really well for galvanic and voltaic cells. But remember, there is another kind of uh, battery, another kind of system called electrolytic cells. Those, when you plug them together, nothing happens. They actually have reversed signs. We won't talk about that too much, but I will show an example of it later if you're curious. So this leads us into the idea of why sometimes, for example, copper gives up electrons to become copper 2 plus, and why sometimes copper 2 plus takes electrons to become copper metal. In nature, we find that there are sometimes forces, and the forces will work one direction but not the other. And as an example of that, I put up there a picture of a waterfall. Water, of course, loves to go from the top to the bottom. It has high potential energy, when it's at the top, like it's ready to flow. And at the bottom, of course, when you're at the bottom, low potential energy. So in the similar way, some elements will be more likely to give up electrons or to receive electrons. It kind of depends what else is around it, of course, but we're going to start talking about the forces that make it possible, and they're called electromotive force. Electrons really only spontaneously flow in one direction in a redox reaction they'll flow from the higher to the lower potential energy. That's kind of how science works generally. But we're going to try and explore here like why some things have higher and lower potential energies and also how to predict them when they happen. So this leads us into the idea of cell potential. And when you hook up a voltmeter to a reaction, and if you look at the video here on the left, you can actually see this happening. All right, you put the leads on the pieces of metal and you get a voltage. Now, right now it's zero, now it's 1.1. Take off the thing, it goes to zero, put it on, it's 1.1. Cell potential, which is measured in volts, all right? For example, like this volt right here, that's actually a way to measure the potential of a cell. And we're going to see that there's ways to figure out what every half reaction has. If you put zinc into zinc 2 plus solution and copper and copper 2 plus ions, you're going to see that the cell potential is 1.10 volts and electrons flow from the zinc to the copper side. So zinc makes zinc 2 plus and copper 2 plus ions make copper. EMF, the electro motive force is a way to measure how electrons are driven, all right? It's all about the energies they have. And if you know how to work EMF and cell potential, you can figure out cell directions for things, lots of things, which is pretty cool. If you connect that zinc and copper cell that we've been looking at, the voltage is 1.10 volts at 25 degrees Celsius and when the concentration of the ions are 1.0 moles per liter. So notice this right away. There's a temperature 
temperature and there's also solution concentrations. And we'll talk in a little bit about how those change if you change those values. But for right now, 25 degrees Celsius, one mole per liter, that kind of stuff are standard conditions. That's what we're talking about. The standard cell potential is the cell potential under these standard conditions. 25 degrees Celsius, one mole per liter concentration. If you have a gas, it would be one atmosphere. And it's something measured in volts. E, capital E, is the symbol for cell potential. And it's measured in volts, V. If it has a little zero by that, that means that it's standard conditions. So for this reaction, under standard conditions, the cell potential is 1.10 volts. And we'll see what to do with that here in a little bit. If you've looked at your own batteries, batteries have a voltage on them as well. And you bet that voltage is related to the voltages we're going to talk about here. We'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of this chapter. The zinc to copper reaction that we've been looking at has two half reactions, zinc going to zinc two plus and copper two plus going to copper metal. And if we knew the half cell reactions potential, we could then add them together to get the overall cell potential. Like we know the overall cell potential is 1.10 volts, but what are the half cell reaction values for zinc going to zinc two plus and copper two plus going to copper? So scientists need a, like a ruler stick, a way to measure cell potentials for reactions. If we had that kind of system, then we could measure half reactions to give overall reactions, blah, blah, blah. So this slide is introducing the measuring stick, if you will, that scientists use to measure cell potential. And the measuring stick that's used by electrochemists is called the standard hydrogen cell. And that's sometimes a tongue twister. The standard hydrogen cell is also known as SHE. SHE stands for standard hydrogen electrode, all right? And this is a half reaction that electrochemists have all together come in on and agreed that this should be like a ruler. Now, if you think about it, to measure length, everybody had to get together at some point in the past and decide that, yes, Yes, this length is a meter okay so the meter stick is arguably the way that people measure length now it's actually different but we'll say it is um, the standard hydrogen electrode is equivalent to the meter stick it's a way that scientists can measure the cell potential in volts for half reactions this reaction right here, which is 2H+, plus, which is an acid aqueous at one mole per liter, combines with two electrons to make hydrogen gas at one atmosphere of pressure. This is the standard hydrogen cell, the Xi electrode, okay? And it's decided upon by electrochemists everywhere that the cell potential will be 0, 0.00 volts. Now that may seem an unusual measuring stick to use, but we're going to see that cell potentials can be both positive or negative. And the way that this one's written, zero volts, it's like good to go in either direction. So there is a method to the madness. It seems strange at first. But for right now, just realize that standard hydrogen electrode is just acid some plus some electrons making hydrogen gas. And it is a double-headed arrow. It's a two-sided street. So you can go from acid to hydrogen gas or hydrogen gas to acid, same size cell potential. Let's go to this reaction. This is a battery. It's zinc and zinc 2 plus. And we also have the Xi electrode on the other side. And we know that because there's H plus and H2. Now, notice that the electrons are flowing from the negative side to the positive side. So they're flowing this way. That's going to be important to us. The zinc is the negative electrode. It's where the electrons are coming from. So that that means here that zinc is being oxidized to zinc 2 plus this left hand side here is the anode and if that's the anode then by default the other side is the cathode so that side is gaining the electrons 2h plus plus two electrons going to h2 gas that's the cathode so in this reaction zinc is giving up electrons to make zinc 2 plus and h plus is gaining electrons to make h2 and when they measure the cell potential here, which is totally doable, you head up one of those uh, voltmeters and stuff, it's pretty easy in physics, you get a positive 0.76 volt value. Hmm. 
Well, if we know that the overall cell is 0.76 volts, and we know that the Xi electrode is zero volts, it's not going to be too hard here to calculate the cell potential of the zinc going to zinc 2 plus. We don't know what that value is. Zinc going to zinc 2 plus is a mystery. But we know that Xi electrode is zero, and we know the overall cell potential, positive 0.76 volts. Well, notice here that if you literally combine the reduction and the oxidation parts, you get this one. You can also literally combine E zinc plus E H plus to give E net. It's literally that simple. And E zinc is an unknown, let's call it X or whatever. We don't know what that is, but 0.76 minus E H plus or 0.76 minus zero, that's going to equal Z zinc, E zinc, positive 0.76 volts. So this is a way that we can, as scientists, figure out the cell potentials of these half reactions. And we just figured out that this reaction right here, zinc going to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons, it's 0.76 volts. Pretty cool. This is the first one of the half potentials or cell potentials for the half reactions that we figured out. We figured it out using the Xi electrode, our, our measuring stick, if you will. We hooked all of this up and found the overall cell potential was positive 0.76 volts. So knowing that, we've got now the half potential for the zinc going to zinc 2 plus reaction. Zinc is a better reducing agent than hydrogen. Now remember, reducing agent means oxidized, and zinc here wanted to be oxidized. Hydrogen didn't want to be oxidized as much as zinc wanted to be oxidized, and that's what we found when we set this stuff up. So you can use this then as a way to calibrate if something is better or worse than another thing. And zinc here wanted to be oxidized, hydrogen gas did not want to be oxidized. It wanted H plus to turn into hydrogen gas. So zinc is a better reducing agent than hydrogen. Zinc is easier to oxidize than hydrogen. Let's do the same thing now, but now we're going to do it with a copper reaction, okay? And this has copper and copper 2 plus, and on the right side again is the Xi electrode. But notice here the signs, all right? First of all, the signs are different. We've got a negative on the, on the right and a positive on the left. So that means electrons are flowing this way. And also notice the cell potential. It's a different value. It's only positive 0.34 volts. So a lot of differences here in this copper versus Xi electrode reaction. Now in this case, the Xi electrode is the supplier of electrodes. It's uh, the electrons. It's the anode. It's the site of oxidation. Hydrogen here wants to go to H plus and electrons. Electrons are going from the Xi electrode to the copper side. And if they're going to the copper side, that means that the copper is the site of reduction. Copper 2 plus is gaining electrons to become copper metal. So the reduction here is on the copper side. Oxidation is on the uh, she side. So you're seeing here that the metals, zinc versus copper, they're doing different things, all right? With the she electrode, the zinc was giving up electrons, but with the she electrode, the copper is gaining the electrons. A different kind of system here. So like before, we're going to figure out the half cell reaction for copper 2 plus going to copper. And like before, the measured cell potential of the whole thing, positive 0.34 volts. Well, this comes from the fact that copper 2 plus going to copper is 0.34 because copper going to copper 2 plus plus she 0.34 plus 0 is 0.34. Big surprise, copper 2 plus going to copper, positive 0.34 volts. Now notice the copper here is being listed as a reduction, copper 2 plus going to copper. In the zinc reaction, zinc going to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons had that other value. So zinc was better best written, if you will, as an oxidation, copper is best written as a reduction.
Now let's put them both together. All right, and this is what we did originally. All right, we're gonna have zinc at the anode. It's gonna be creating the electrons for the copper, which is accepting them. So the anode is the zinc side, the cathode is the copper side, salt bridge, etc., etc. Now, this is where it gets kind of fun. Zinc here is going to zinc two plus plus two electrons and the cell potential positive 0.76 volts. The copper two plus is accepting those electrons, make copper metal, and we we saw that its cell potential positive 0.34 volts. Well, if you add up the two half reactions, you add up the two cell potentials, 0.76 plus 0.34, bam, 1.10 volts, and that's what they, was measured when we saw originally in this problem a long time ago. So this is how people find the cell potentials for all these different half reactions. In the ideal world, they'd use the Xi electrode, all right, and they'd compare it to Xi and figure it out. However, to be honest, using strong acids and hydrogen gas can be kind of weird. So instead of using Xi, sometimes people then would use the zinc reaction or the copper reaction, and they can compare the overall cell potential to the cell potential of the half reaction in order to find the missing half reaction. So it's kind of cool how they develop these kind of tables. In this problem, we want to determine the cell potential for this reaction, and it's nickel plus the mercury 2, 2 plus ion going to nickel 2 plus and 2 mercuries, all right? If the reactions are already written in the correct form, you can literally just add up the half cell reactions, the 0.25 volts and the 0.79 volts, to give the overall cell potential. So if you look at these half reactions, well, nickel is a reactant and nickel 2 plus is a product, so that looks okay. Uh, mercury 2, 2 plus is a reactant. Yep, that's okay. And mercury is a product. That's okay. The electrons will cancel if you add them. So literally in this problem, it is as simple as adding up the two half cell reactions. So 0.25 plus 0.79, that comes out to be 1.04 volts. That's the cell potential of this reaction. So notice that if everything's set up right, you literally add the half reactions together together and you add the cell potentials together to give the overall cell potential for the whole reaction. The 1.04 volts is what you would measure if you put nickel and the mercury 2 plus, two, two plus ions together in a voltaic cell. Scientists have uh, definitely measured a whole bunch of half reactions, and there's a whole bunch of them out there, and we're gonna see some of them. Problem set five has a list of some of these uh, potentials on there. And what they've done is they've listed them all as reduction potentials, which means they're being reduced, all right? An oxidizing agent is the same as something being reduction. So they call these reduction tables or tables of reduction potentials, and that's because they're all listed as reductions. Um, it's in your textbook. I definitely recommend using the one in problem set number five, because that's the one we'll be uh, using a lot. But you can see literally everything, uh, all the ones that are known, and there's more than that, that are out there, but it's a pretty extensive list, which is kind of cool. One thing though, because they're all listed as reductions, some of them we're gonna wanna see as oxidations because in an electrolytic cell, you must have one being reduced and one being oxidized. You must have a cathode and you must have an anode. So if you do need to reverse a half reaction, and you will, you wanna change the sign of the cell potential but not the magnitude of the E cell value. So as an example, zinc going to zinc Zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons, that's written right now as an oxidation. And this would not be in the table of reduction potentials because we don't put oxidations in with the reductions. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway, if you wanted to put it in the table of reductions, you'd have to flip this equation around. You'd have to make zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons going to zinc metal. So if you do that, you flip reactants and products, you change the the sign of E, but that's it. All right, so E naught becomes a negative 0.76 instead of positive 0.76. Everything else is the same. Now, you will see this one in the table because that's a reduction. A table of reduction potentials mean a whole bunch of things listed as reduction, and they're usually listed by their E cell value, so most positive to less positive or, or the other way, something like that. But just realize you won't see 
zinc going to zinc 2 plus, but you will see zinc 2 plus going to zinc. And it's easy to translate. Just flip the sign of E, you're good to go. E naught tables are usually listed, like I said, as reductions, and so there's many negative E cell values. But that doesn't mean that E cell values that are negative are bad, it just means that probably they would prefer to be oxidized. So generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, the negative E naught values that you're going to see, those things want to be oxidized like zinc. On the other hand, the thing that have positive E naught values, they generally like to be reduced. And again, there's different variables and we'll talk about that more, but that's kind of a rough rule of thumb. Negative E imply great oxidizers or reducing agents, and positive E values uh, represent good things that like to be reduced or great oxidizing agents. So this is how people think about these. It's a little bit weird, but again, if you break all this down, you've got it. Just break it down into pieces that make sense. Here's the table of reduction potentials that we'll use in Chem 223. And you can find longer lists and all kinds of lists if you look online. However, the values we use and stuff will come from this table, so it's a good idea to check it out. Now, first of all, all of these are reductions. An electron is a reactant for all of these, okay? None of these are listed as oxidations. The second thing, this one is listed from most positive cell potentials to most negative cell potentials. So what that means is we talked about them, the things that have positive E cell values are great things to be reduced. So for example, we've seen so many times that, for example, fluorine really likes to be fluoride in ionic compounds. Uh, fluorine always likes electrons, most electronegative, blah, blah, blah. This has a really high cell potential. It wants to be reduced. On the other hand, down here on the bottom, you have things like lithium ions making lithium with very negative cell potentials. Well, the group 1A metals don't like to be pure metals. They would prefer to be cations. So if you flip the lithium reaction around, you get a positive 3.05 volts. That just says that lithium loves to be lithium plus an electron. It doesn't really like having lithium plus an electron making lithium metal. It's much more difficult. As you go up the list, all right, you can think about it that it, the things are more likely to be reduced, like fluorine likes to gain electrons. Things that are reduced are also, of course, known as oxidizing agents. On the other hand, don't think that the negative things are bad by any means. Negative things are just most likely they want to be oxidized. Lithium wants to lose an electron to make lithium plus, and magnesium wants to lose two electrons to make magnesium plus, etc., etc. And if something is oxidized, that also means that it's a good reducing agent. So these tables are really cool. Um, right in the middle, in this one, it's in a kind of a blue color, hard to see maybe. That's the Xi electrode. You can find this same table in problem set five, and I do recommend you check it out. In electrochemistry, sometimes they talk about the northwest-southeast rule. And this is one way to tell if you can have a reaction occur or not. Now, northwest is upper left, southeast is lower right. And the rule here is that if you have a table of reduction potentials that starts positive and goes more negative, then any substance on the right will reduce any substance on the left, all right? So what that means, as we've seen, is that uh, zinc can make copper 2 plus go to copper metal and zinc 2 plus if you flip the reaction around. The southeast part is the anode and the northwest corner is the cathode, all right? And so if you have a table in, re in, in um, getting more negative uh, cell potentials, then the northwest southeast rule is right. So you could say, for example, zinc uh, would also do the same thing with H plus. But you wouldn't say, for example, uh, zinc 2 plus and hydrogen. That would be the opposite direction. Now, I'll be honest, I don't really like the northwest southeast rule. To me, that seems, uh, seems very uh, arbitrary. You have to have a redox potential table that's listed in decreasing cell potentials. And honestly, there's some other types of tables out there. So, 
I personally am not a big fan of Northwest Southeast, but some people really do, and I want to introduce it. My way of figuring out if you can, if what a cell potential is, is just to literally uh, take the reduction potentials. You'll have to rewrite one of them for an oxidation, which means you flip the sign, and then you just add the cell potentials. So this is more like a Hess's law, I guess, kind of way, but honestly, to me, this seems really easy. So let's say you wanted to find the cell potential for this reaction, which which is two aluminums and three nickel two pluses, making two aluminum three pluses and three nickel metals, all right? So you'd go to a table of reduction potentials, and because they're listed as reductions, all right, they'll be listed like this. Now, notice that the nickel two plus is a reactant right here, and we want nickel two plus as a reactant. However, we really want aluminum as a reactant, and as a reduction, you can see that aluminum is is listed as a product. So from the redox tables, we will keep the nickel as is, but we do need to flip the aluminum around. We want aluminum as a reactant, not a product. We want aluminum three plus as a product, not a reactant. So if you flip that one around, negative 1.66 becomes positive 1.66. You can add the aluminum to the nickel one. I starred up there earlier, 1.66 minus 0.25 this cell potential 1.41 volts. Again, I call this Michael's method because I'm arrogant, I suppose. You don't have to do that by any means. Um, I find this easier. Just remember, if you flip a reaction, change the sign, add them together, you're good to go. It doesn't depend on the number of electrons transferred. We'll talk about later a situation where it could, but not here. Let's say you wanted to find the cell potential for the reaction between copper and silver plus ions. And if you look at a table of reductions, these are the two values you get. And you can see copper is in the southeast and silver plus is in the northwest, all right? Well, there's two ways to do this. So here's the two half reactions, okay? And the silver is okay as is, all right? Silver plus, we want it to go to silver. But copper two plus, all right, we wanna flip that reaction around because we want copper to react with silver plus, not copper two plus with silver plus. So if you change that, the positive 0.337 volts becomes a negative 0.337 volts, and the overall potential here would be 0 0.80 minus 0.337 cell potential positive 0.46 volts. So this reaction, copper plus two silver plus makes two silver plus copper two plus positive 0.46 volts. So again, I find that very easy to do. Of course, you could also go northwest minus southeast, but I find that very confusing. That would be another way to do it. Any way you do it, just pick one method and stick with it. Don't try and flip it around. Again, I highly recommend that you just write out the half reactions, get them the way you want it. We wanted silver plus, but we wanted copper, not copper two plus, so we flip that one around, change the sign, good to go. So this leads to the kind of question like this one. We've got a cadmium cell and we have an iron cell. And the question is, which direction are we going to go? One possibility is that cadmium would be oxidized to cadmium 2 plus and the iron 2 plus would be reduced to iron. But the other possibility, which at this point is just as likely, Cadmium 2 plus could be reduced to cadmium metal and iron could be oxidized to iron 2 plus. So which one is it? It's either going to be the top one or the bottom one. And the way to figure this out is to look at those tables of redox potential. If you look at the tables, iron plus two going to iron is negative 0.40 volts. And cadmium two plus going to cadmium is negative 0.44 volts. We're gonna see here in a little bit that reactions are spontaneous, which means they happen by themselves when E values are positive. So what we wanna do is we wanna combine those two reactions in order to give an overall positive value. Now you must have some something oxidized and something reduced. And right now they're both reductions. So we need to flip 
one around. Well, if you flipped around the iron one, you'd end up with a positive 0 0.40 volts. And if you add that to negative 0.44 volts, you're still going to get a negative E naught value. So you don't want to flip that one. You want to flip the cadmium one around. Because if you flip the cadmium, your negative 0.44 becomes a positive 0.44. And positive 0.44 minus 0.4, you get positive 0 0.04 volts left over. So what that means is that in this reaction, the iron 2 plus is being reduced to iron and the cadmium is being oxidized to cadmium 2 plus. There's other things you can do with cell potential. Maybe you're curious, can the iodide ion reduce water? I have no idea. No, seriously, as a human being, I know sometimes when people are backpacking or places with water with that's kind of uncertain quality, sometimes you can use iodide to purify water. So, I mean, I don't think that iodide could be added to water and have a chemical reaction occur. It's supposed to purify the water. But that being said, I honestly don't know. So what you could do as a scientist at this point is you could look up in tables and you could find a water going to hydrogen and hydroxide, which is a reduction. All right, water here is gaining electrons to make those other things. And you could also look up the iodide ion going to iodine. It has a negative 0.535 volts. Well, this is a first one was a reduction. The second one is an oxidation. So when you add the half reactions, the electrons cancel. You're left with two iodides plus two waters making iodine plus two hydroxides plus hydrogen gas. That's great. What's the cell potential? Well, the cell potential as written, negative 1.363 volts. Now, negative cell potentials are not spontaneous. So here we would say that that negative E0 means that reaction is not going to happen. In fact, it's more likely to occur in the opposite direction, i.e. iodine reacting with hydroxide and H2 gas to make iodide and water. That would have a positive E cell value. But water, um, iodide ion reducing water, that's not going to happen, at least not spontaneously. And that's what the signs will help you with. Positive signs happen spontaneously negative signs do not. The question here, will liquid mercury reduce tin 2 plus to tin? Okay. In a reaction like this, and it says yes, no, or more information, all right, it's, you have to be very careful where your reactants and products are. And what this is saying is that you want mercury as a liquid, as a reactant, because it's going to reduce tin 2 plus the other reactant. So if you look at the half potentials, well, tin 2 plus is a reactant, so we don't have to do anything with that value. But you can see here that you want mercury as a liquid to react with tin 2 plus. And mercury as a liquid is a product. We need to flip that half reaction around. And if you do, that positive 0.79 volts becomes negative 0.79 volts. And if you add that to the already negative 0.14 volts, you're going to get some negative number, negative 0.93 volts. Negative cell potentials are not spontaneous. So when it says, will it reduce it? No. Non-spontaneous means, uh-uh, don't think so. You're going to have to do something else uh, if you want your tin 2 plus to turn into tin metal. This question says, okay, iodide won't reduce water. I understand. Can we make it reduce water? Ooh, well, negative 1.363 volts would really represent an electrolytic cell, electrolysis, which is when if you put the pieces together, nothing happens. However, if we add some energy, you can force these reactions to occur using external voltage. So the negative 1.363 volts, besides telling us that it's non-spontaneous, you can actually realize that 
that if you were to add 1.363 volts to it, you could make this happen. And that's where external voltage comes in. And you can use voltage from an outlet in your house. You can use all kinds of any way that creates electricity, like a dam or wind power or whatever and stuff. Any way you can get voltage, if you add 1.363 volts to it, you can make this happen batteries are great, voltaic cells are great, wind power, if you got a big windmill, you know, whatever you're using for making voltage, you can do it if you add the positive version of that volt to it. And that's kind of a cool thing. So this is an example of an electrolytic cell. You have to add energy to make this happen. If you put iodide with water, nothing happens, but you add 1.363 volts to it, then you start having something happening. And this is electro Electrolysis. electrolysis is really the act of adding electromotive force or voltage to a reaction to make something non-spontaneous happen. And that's pretty cool because normally non-spontaneous things can be tough to get them to go. In this case, if you just add some external voltage, you're good to go. The question sometimes pops up, are you cheating the second law of thermodynamics, like the delta S of the universe has to be greater than zero? And it may feel that way. Like it may feel like non-spontaneous reactions all of a sudden occurring would be that way. But what we're doing is we're really using second law to make the voltage in another location somehow, all right? We're using a battery, using up the battery or something like that. So that is where the second law is being appeased and we use that energy then to make this kind of thing happens. So we're not really cheating the second law. It kind of feels that way, but you're not really cheating it. Darn it. Michael Faraday was a great electrochemist, and one of the things that he studied a lot was how electrolytic cells relate to the spontaneity of a reaction. And through a long series of events, this equation was born where the Gibbs free energy delta G equals minus NFE. Now, all of those things have a factor, but I want to talk about F first. F is what they call the Faraday constant, and it represents 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons, or if you want to use scientific notation, 9.6485 times 10 to the fourth coulombs per mole of electrons. N is the number of moles of electrons transferred. So that'll be something we'll talk about here in a little bit. And if you multiply N and F by the cell potential and put a negative sign in front of it, you're good to go. I highly recommend you memorize slash put in your calculator the Faraday constant. We'll use it a lot in this section. That is the last constant you need to memorize, hint, hint, so that's kind of cool too. But anyway, F is something we'll use a lot. So let's see how you do it. Now we've already seen that cell potential, if it's positive, that means spontaneous, which means negative delta G. You can see with the negative sign in there, negative will turn the positive E into a negative number, delta G will be negative, life is good. Delta G equals minus NFE. If you have a product favored reactant, reaction, excuse me, reactants want to go to products, that means your delta G is going to be negative, less than zero, and your E naught is going to be positive. So that's why cell potentials that are positive, those are the ones that are going to occur. They're going to be product favored. On the other hand, in a reactant favored reaction, then products don't really want to form and their system's kind of stuck on the reactant side. Those are non-spontaneous reactions. Delta G is greater than zero. E naught is going to be negative in those. So every time you have a positive cell potential, that's going to be spontaneous. Delta G is going to happen. On the other hand, negative cell potentials, those are usually dead in the water. Delta G would be positive, non-spontaneous, nothing happens. Happens. So let's determine delta G for this reaction. Tin 2 plus plus vanadium going to tin plus vanadium 2 plus and the cell potential positive 1.07 volts. Now delta G equals minus NFE but notice here that cell potential E is a positive number and a positive number and F and N will be positive times a negative there for nine minus NFE means delta G is going to be a negative number. So the answers here will not be A, B, or C. Those are all positive numbers or zero. It's going to be D or E. Now, 
<clears throat> cell potential, 1.07 volts, that's E naught. Faraday, 96,485, no problem. N is the moles of electrons transferred. And you can look at either reactants or products like we talked about briefly earlier. I'm going to look at the tin here. Tin is going from a positive 2 to a 0. That means that 2 moles of electrons are transferred per mole of tin 2 plus. You can also look from the vanadium's perspective. V is going from a zero to a positive two. That means vanadium is losing two electrons. N is the moles of electrons transferred. It's going to be two here. So you'd go minus two times Faraday times 1.07. You're going to get a really big number. People usually divide by a thousand, turn joules into kilojoules, minus 206 kilojoules here. Notice that delta G initially comes out in joules, so you can turn it into kilojoules pretty readily. No problem. One more thing we're going to do. Sometimes it's nice to know how long a battery will last or considering how much of a compound you can make. And this introduces an idea of what's called quantitative electrochemistry. Quantitative means how much. So let's say we wanted to turn silver ions into silver metal, and sometimes silver metal is worth a lot. Well, every mole of silver ions need a mole of electrons to make a mole of silver. Well, you can actually figure these kind of things out, but we need to talk about some new kinds of units. And the important one right here is this one right here. I stands for current. So current is I. And current, which is usually measured in amps, an amp is a coulomb per second. Okay, so if I said you had a current of 3.1 amps, you could think about that as 3.1 coulombs per second. A coulomb is a measure of charge. We talked about coulombs briefly in Chem 221. An electron and a proton have so many coulombs. They're the opposite charge. Electrons are negative, positive uh, protons, etc., etc. But just remember here, an amp is a coulomb per second. So knowing that, these problems aren't too bad. In this problem, 1.50 amps, and notice what I did. I right away wrote 1.50 coulombs per second. 1.50 coulombs per second are flowing through a silver plus solution for 15 minutes. And the question is, how much silver metal is going to be deposited? Cool. So what I would do on this problem is start with the time and work, work my way over into how much mass is there. And I'll show you how this works. We're going to be using the Faraday constant. Remember the Faraday, 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. So you can see here I've got minutes. I'm going to turn minutes into seconds so I can use the amps, all right? Coulombs and Coulomb's law, or Coulomb's constant, or Faraday constant, excuse me, I can use Coulombs, turn them into moles of electrons, and this is silver plus. So you need one mole of silver plus to react with one mole of electrons to make one mole of silver. And from moles, you can go to grams. Let's first of all calculate the charge in coulombs, which means turn your time into seconds and multiply by the amps. So every minute is worth 60 seconds, and we have 15 minutes. And for every second, you have 1.50 coulombs transferred through. So that means in this problem, we have a total of 1,350 coulombs of charge transferred through. Woohoo! Now we have the Faraday constant. We can use those coulombs and the coulombs per mole in order to find how many moles of electrons that represents. 96,045 coulombs per mole of electrons is the Faraday constant. And we have 1350 coulombs. So if you take 1350 divided by the Faraday, you get 0 0.0140 moles of electrons. All right? That's where the Faraday constant comes in. Now, this is silver plus going to silver. It's one electron per silver atom that's formed. So if you take that moles of electrons and you realize it's one to one with silver, then that many moles of electrons represents that many moles of silver. And you can turn it into moles of silver, and you multiply by the molar mass of silver, which is like 107.8, something like that, 1.51 grams of silver. So this is how you do these kind of problems. It's pretty chill. 
Usually these problems, you start with time and you work to quantity. So that's what we did here. We started with minutes, basically, and worked our way to grams. Some of these problems, you start with grams or moles and you work back to time. Those are the two ways that these problems go. And they're both pretty easy as long as you follow these steps. Here's an example of how long something will last, i.e. time, all right? And in this problem, we're starting with quantity, how many grams, and we just wanna know how long this battery's gonna last. So you're driving out in the desert with your homemade battery, you don't wanna have a dead desert in the battery, I guess that's the kind of idea. Anyway, it's kind of the opposite of what we just did. Let's turn grams into moles, so to take 454 grams, divide by the molar mass of lead to get the moles. Um, Lead here, you can see, is a two-electron process. Lead 2 plus is what we have in this battery. So there's two electrons per mole of lead. So what we're going to do here is multiply that number by 2. 4.38 moles of electrons have been tr uh, are needed for this process. Okay, well, after moles of electrons, we'll use the Faraday constant, 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons times 4.38 moles of electrons, 423,000 coulombs, oh goodness. And then the last thing, if you remember from before, every time you see amp, think coulombs per second. So with 423,000 coulombs, and we have 1.50 amps, which is 1.50 coulombs per second, you want to take coulombs and divide by coulombs per second, or you can take coulombs, and yeah, whatever you want to do. Anyway, it comes out to be 282,000 seconds. And because who knows how long that really is, I divided first by 60 to get to minutes, and then I divided again by 60 to get to hours. It's about seven hours in this case. So your battery would last roughly 78 hours. Cool. Here's a process where we're plating gold, taking gold three plus ions and turning them into gold metal. And the question is, how long will it take to electrolyze 0 0.010 moles of gold solution using a two amp current? All right. Well, this is a problem where we're starting with quantity and we want to turn it into time. So it's a lot like the lead sample we did earlier. Um, I do this problem because I wanted to show you we have 0 0.0100 moles of gold three plus and we need three three moles of electrons per mole of gold. And that's gonna turn gold three plus into the gold metal. And from there you can use Faraday to find coulombs and then coulombs per second is what amps is. So you can find seconds and convert if necessary. So here's the math, 2.0 amps, 2.00 coulombs. Because it's gold three plus, you need three moles of electrons per mole of gold. That gold three of course is the same three as right there. And then once you have mole of electrons, uh, multiply it by coulombs, divide by the amps, or one second per two zero zero coulombs, 1,450 seconds, no big deal. One more thing we have to talk about. So far, all of our cell potentials have been under standard conditions where we're using E naught, all right? However, in the Nernst equation, you can deal with cell potentials that haven't been studied under standard conditions. And if you're going to Death Valley, or if you're going to the North Pole, you may not have 25 degrees Celsius. You might have different pressures, concentrations, stuff like that. So Nernst, of the Nernst equation, was the one that pulled this all together. Together. And this thing right here is the Nernst equation. E, the cell potential under non-standard conditions, equals E naught, the cell potential under standard conditions, minus RT over NF natural log of Q. Oh goodness, there's a lot of things right here. Anyway, R is the gas constant R, the energy R, 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin. T is, big surprise, the Kelvin temperature. F is the Faraday constant. E naught, again, standard cell potential. All right, so you still need to figure out the standard cell potential. We're gonna compare it with this other stuff to find the non-standard cell potential. N is the moles of electrons transferred. And then Q, as we'll see here in a little bit, that's the reaction 
action quotient we saw back in chapter 13. It's like a non-standard way to calculate an equilibrium constant. And if that doesn't make a lot of sense, don't worry, I'll show you an example here in a little bit. Anyway, cell potentials under non-standard conditions, you really do need this Nernst equation because you can have a temperature other than 298 Kelvin. Uh, you can have uh, different kinds of concentrations, which is where the reaction quotient comes in. So it can be a really helpful equation. It's kind of an ugly equation to use, but it does have a lot of really cool uses. A zinc copper cell shows a potential equal to the standard potential of 1.10 volts when both zinc and copper are in solution at the same concentration. If more copper ion is added to the cathode compartment solution, however, the cell potential increases. So this is an example of where Nernst equation can be helpful. Okay, copper 2 plus plus zinc, making zinc 2 plus and copper metal, which we've seen a lot of times. And we saw earlier that the standard cell potential 1.10 volts, but that's assuming you're at 25 degrees Celsius and the concentration of the zinc 2 plus and the copper 2 plus ions one mole per liter. Well, all of a sudden you add some extra copper 2 plus. So it's no longer 1.0 moles per liter. Maybe it's 1.1. And if you look there carefully, the cell potential went from 1.10 volts to 1.11 volts. It went up. Now, if you go back to Le Chatelier's principle, if you add a reactant, the reaction will shift to the product side. All right. So that's Le Chatelier's principle in effect and that's totally cool, we can use the Nernst equation to actually calculate what the new potential is going to be. Obviously, adding the copper 2 plus made the reaction more spontaneous, like you had more action. E naught became more positive. Delta G equals minus NFE. You could figure out what the new delta G was. Uh, anyway, Nernst equation will allow us to make sense of how this all works out. Let's do an example with the Nernst equation. Let's find the cell potential E, and there's no zero up there. Let's find the cell potential under these non-standard conditions when the zinc 2 plus is 0 0.0010 moles per liter, the pressure of the H2 is 0 0.10 atmospheres, and the pH is zero at 290 Kelvin. And at first, when you look at that, you might be thinking, what the? Okay, and I totally dig it. So let's break this down. Let's figure out what the reaction is under standard conditions first. And we'll try to interpret all this. So you can see we have H2. We have some acid, H+, plus, because that's what pH is all about. And we've also got some zinc 2 plus. So if you think about this long enough, this is nothing more than the zinc reaction reacting with the Xi electrode. And we saw earlier that this has a standard cell potential of 0.76 volts. Xi is automatically zero. And from Xi, you can figure out the zinc going to zinc 2 plus is 0.76 volts when written as an oxidation. So the E naught, the standard cell conditions, if this was 298 Kelvin and uh, all the atmospheres were one and the concentrations were one mole per liter, uh, the cell potential would be positive 0.76 volts. However, in this example, we're gonna see we're not under standard conditions. So we're gonna take this 0.76 number and do some stuff to it. Now, along the way, before we go, I want you to see that the N, the number of electrons transferred, it's two. The zinc gave up two electrons and the Xi electrode gained two electrons. So the N value is literally the number of electrons that are taken or transferred in a redox reaction. The Nernst equation, E equals E naught minus RTNF natural log of Q. Okay, no problem. Let's deal with the RTNF and E naught parts and we'll do Q here in a little bit. <clears throat> Now, the cell potential under standard conditions, that's the 0.76 number. Then minus RTNF minus R minus T in Kelvin. N is 2, F is 96,045. All right, so that's the E naught minus RT over NF part. But then we've got natural log of Q. Now, remember, reaction quotients Q 
products over reactants and everything uh, raised to the power, don't include solids, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in this problem, this is what we want to use for Q. So we're going to have zinc 2 plus and H2 gas in the product side, the numerator, and we'll have H plus squared in the denominator. And we're going to put in the different values. So here's the zinc 2 plus. Here's the pressure of the H2 gas. We need to figure out what pH of 0 means, et cetera, et cetera. Well, pH is easy. You can turn that into H plus by going 10 raised to the power of minus pH. So that's actually 1.0 moles per liter. That is actually a standard condition for these kind of problems. So the Q then, products over reactants, zinc 2 plus times the pressure of hydrogen divided by H plus squared. This is what they call a mixed equilibrium constant because you have pressures and concentrations and that's okay for these kind. Anyway, 0.00 one zero that's the zinc here's the pressure of the hydrogen gas 1.0 moles per liter is the h plus concentration you can solve for q this way if you do all this right you go minus rt over nf and then natural log of all this stuff right here you should get for all of that positive 0.12 volts. So the E potential, the cell potential of our non-standard conditions, 0.88 volts. Whoa. Okay. Why this is more positive than the standard condition is because our zinc 2 plus and hydrogen gas are less than standard. Like zinc 2 plus standard would be one mole per liter and it's 0 0.0010. And the pressure of H2 normally would be one atmosphere and this is 0.1 atmospheres. So what that means here, we've essentially lowered the product concentrations. And by Le Chatelier's principle again, you take out a product, the reaction should shift to the side you take something out from. That's gonna shift this to the right, more to the the right means more spontaneous, which means bigger E. So Nernst equation fits in really well with everything else we've done. And I kind of like this problem. It's kind of towards the end of Chem 223. We've got the pH. We've got the cell potential. We have Le Chatelier's. We've got redox. We've got energy R. I mean, we've even got the Faraday, right? We've got everything in here in this Nernst equation. Ah. Anyway, it's towards the end of the term. I got to chill out here. But anyway, hopefully you see the utility of it. If you have one of these weird conditions and stuff, uh, you can actually figure out how this stuff works out. There are quicker ways sometimes to calculate these combinations. You can go directly from a cell potential to an equilibrium constant, if you want, using E naught equals RT over NF natural log of K. And sometimes people use this. I usually am a person, I go through delta G. So if I had an E naught, I wanted to turn it to K, I would first go delta G equals uh, minus NFE. And you have to remember delta G is also equal to minus RT natural log log of K. And if you combine both of those, that's where this equation pops into. If you're at 298 Kelvin and remembering that R is a constant and also the Faraday, E naught equals 0 0.0257 divided by N times the natural log of K. So that's another way that kind of helps out and stuff here. Um, N of course is all over the place, depends on moles of electrons transferred. But if you're at 298 Kelvin, which is really common, then you can substitute in 298 times R divided by F to get that constant and you're good to go. This is a triangle that sometimes people use in this material. It just shows the different ways to go between delta G, E, and K. So we talked about, or I talked about earlier, how delta G equals minus RT natural log of K. That goes on the left-hand side of the triangle. On the bottom, delta G equals minus NFE. And on the right, then you have this E cell equals RT over NF natural log of K. Oh, the places we will go. Okay, that's the end of the chapter 17 lecture. I really appreciate you spending your time with me. Um, some other things to help you study. There is a study guide, which is a bulleted list of the highlights from this chapter. And I do recommend you go through it just to make sure you're good to go. There's also a concept guide. This is worked problems using the material from this chapter. And I do encourage you to look at that too. It gives you an idea how the processes work. If you're not sure how to find cell potential or balance or redox reaction, that kind of stuff, it'll give you examples. Types of equilibrium constants 
is a handout that might be helpful. We had Q in this particular chapter, which is the reaction quotient, might be cool. Right after this slide, there's an important equation slide that'll show you some of the important things from this chapter. And then after that are some end of chapter problems where the problems are on one page and the answers are after that. I encourage you to try the problems, make sure you can do them before moving on. If you do get stuck on the problems or you get stuck on any of this material, please reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help. Electrochemistry is kind of funky, but it is really powerful and I know it's all stuff you can do. So reach out to me. I'm happy to help. You can also talk to the Learning Success Center slash Avid Center uh, at Mount Hood. All of us are here to help you make sure you've got this stuff done. Okay, uh, good luck with your studying. Thanks again for spending your time with me and have a wonderful day.